Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Welcome to our continuing series on the Palestine struggle, uh, a new approach. And today uh, I'm so honored uh, to have uh, a person that uh, has done tremendous work in the international arena uh, on human rights and um, justice. And, uh, you know, we have a platform issue called human security, which is the security of civilian populations uh, and, and working um, in, in terms of national security, not just uh, the security of the state, but the security of the people. And the idea actually came from this person, Muna Ali Khalil. Uh, Muna is a public international lawyer with 25 years uh, of United Nations and other legal and diplomatic experience, including a senior legal officer in the UN Office of the Legal Council and in the International Atomic Energy Agency Office of Legal Affairs. In the United Nations, she advised on the UN Security Council's peace and security efforts, including peacekeeping, protection of civilians, counterterrorism, weapons of mass destruct, uh, destruction, disarmament. In the IAEA, she advised on the international measures to combat nuclear terrorism and to prevent nuclear proliferation. Uh, she, by the way, worked very closely with Dr. Mohamed al uh, a Nobel laureate uh, who uh, worked on nuclear non-proliferation and nuclear disarmament. Um, during her UN career, she also undertook several special assignments relating to the conflicts in Iraq, Libya, Palestine, and Syria. As founder and director of MAK Law International, a strategic consulting service, she continues to serve We the Peoples, advising governments and intergovernmental organizations on the principles and policies that govern their rights and responsibilities under international law. She has a BA in government and an MA uh, in Mass Middle East Studies from Harvard University. She also holds an MS, Master's in Science in Foreign Service and a Juris Doctorate from Georgetown University. She is an affiliate of the Harvard Law School Program on International Law and Armed Conflict and a non-resident fellow of the UN Institute for Disarmament Research. She has published several works on international law and diplomacy and lectures regularly at the Vienna Diplomatic Academy. And she, by the way, Mona Ali Khalil, is calling in, Zooming in from Vienna where it is 1 a.m. Uh, at this time. So we really appreciate the time that you're, you're taking for this uh, and uh, sacrifice uh, uh, for uh, joining us. And we're so uh, honored to have you, Mona. So with that, uh, I'd like you to start your presentation. Thank you, Salam. It really is my honor to be uh, hosted by you and by MPAC, the important work that you do educating your fellow Americans on causes uh, dear to the heart of many Americans and many Arab Americans and Muslim Americans and non-Arab Americans and non-Muslim Americans. We are all at the end of the day, fellow human beings and members of the same human family. Um, and your work to remind people of those fundamentals is, is essential um, for the, not just the democracy, but the security of, of the United States of America. Um, I, I'm humbled um, to be asked to come here given the other members of the uh, series that you have invited. I'm honored, of course. Um, I'm worried a little bit about coming off as a dry lawyer, <laughs> but in order to do justice to the, to the cause and to ensure that uh, the credibility and the, uh, and the equality of the presentation, the objectivity of the presentation, by definition, I have to try to be as clear and dry and factual as possible. So to avoid giving that ultimate impression, I thought I would start with a poem that I wrote um, on the eve of the submission of the uh, membership application by the Palestinian Authority to the Security Council knowing full well that this membership application had no chance of success in the Security Council, given the proclivities in particular of the United States, um, but also wondering why our uh, uh, distinguished leadership of the Palestinian Authority chose to seek membership before they sought recognition of their statehood, in a sense, making it inevitable that there would be a rejection of the application and that the human rights struggle of the Palestinian people was never about membership in the UN, but rather about recognition of their right to self-determination, a fundamentally inalienable legal right of the people of Palestine, as well as the right of the 
other community members of the international uh, membership of the UN to recognize our statehood, not necessarily our membership. Um, so kind of as a lawyer, as an international civil servant in the UN at the time, as a uh, Arab national and a Muslim of Palestinian origin, um, these you know, turmoils within me uh, were found expression in, in this poem that I'm happy to share with you. It's very short, don't worry. Um, as a lawyer, I'm not that particularly creative or poetic, but it seems to be my expression of what those legal rights are in, in that moment of, of, I would say, despair, for lack of a better word. Um, so it's titled, I am Palestine. And here, here goes. Too many lovers of my land, each drawing lines, drawing blood in the sand. I was not spared Solomon's solution, partitioned by a UN resolution. Coveted by those who deny me, occupied with my rights, denied me. Unfulfilled promises for the promised land, unholy violence in the holy land. Jerusalem crowns my inspiration, the capital of my aspiring nation. Divided in two and shared by three, my city, like my people, longs to be free. I gave up most of me for peace, and yet my occupation does not cease. Wanting what's left of me to be my own, hoping that my identity will be known. Can I not demand justice for my historical claim without it being a zero-sum game? Can I not exact recognition of the cost that I was made to pay for Europe's Holocaust? Let me fly my flag with yours. Let my rights be alienable no more. Welcome me not as a guest in my own home and liberate my star, my cross, and my dome. Let me sing my name out loud. Let my people dare to be proud. Embrace me as I have embraced thee, and then maybe we will both be free. So with that introduction. That, uh, that, I mean, can you please send it? I'd like to post it on. Mm -hmm. uh, and look, people are applauding uh, uh, in, 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 on the Zoom. So you, mm -hmm. it, it, it deserves a standing ovation if we were in a room right now. Uh, <laughs> well, could you please send it? We'd love to uh, post it on our website and uh, where, you know, where we're going to broadcast the lecture series. I will, I will do that afterwards. Um, and uh, please don't forget that that was the inspiring part of the discussion because from here on in, it might get a little drier with the legal stuff. Well, we need, um, we need both. We need the inspiration and then we need the knowledge. And I know you're going to drop a lot of important knowledge for us today. Thanks, Salam. So go right ahead. Uh, any, any true UN civil servant cannot begin any discussion without first referring to Dag Hammarskjöld and then referring to the UN Charter. So without further ado, I begin with a reference to our premier or quintessential secretary general of the UN, Dag Hammarskjöld, who once said that the UN was not created to take mankind to heaven, but rather to save it from hell. Um, he and his wisdom, upon witnessing what he deemed to be Israel's disproportionate military responses to provocations from Gaza, back in 1956, wrote a letter to what at the time was his personal friend and a very private letter to Israeli Prime Minister Ben Gurion. And in it, he presciently said, and I quote, you are convinced that acts of Israeli retaliation will stop further incidents. I am convinced that they will lead to further incidents. You believe that this way of creating respect for Israel will pave the way for sound coexistence with the Arab people. Yet I believe that the policy may postpone indefinitely the time for such coexistence. So here we are 65 years later in 2021, and in light of the recent events in Gaza, where again, we saw disproportionate use of force against primarily civilian targets, we have not come a long way, baby, since the statement by 1956. And that is in part a function of the failure to respect international law by each and every actor in the UN system, including the UN, including the US, including Israel, including the Palestinian uh, Authority, including Hamas for sure, and including every state in the UN system, which has uh, obligations under the Geneva Conventions to ensure respect for the most fundamental binding obligations of those conventions. So where, where I would like to see a new approach is not in creating something new, but rather in going back to the basics, going back to the fundamentals, 
the universally accepted, the universally embraced, and the universally recognized as binding principles of international law. A political effort that is not rooted and underpinned by those legal principles will never succeed because peace without justice will not succeed. Justice without sustainable peace are, are, is a non-working formula. Um, and in order for security to visit both peoples and the Israeli people and the Palestinian people are equally entitled to have their children grow up in security, to have their rights as human beings recognized and their self-determination as a people respected and allowed to manifest itself. Um, so all of those rights are equal, but they are not equally enjoyed. They're not equally respected and they're certainly not equally recognized. And until we have that fundamental recognition at the negotiating table, and when those fundamental rights are not themselves negotiable, then we may have a better approach, a more successful approach uh, to the resolution of the Arab-Israeli conflict, and more importantly, at the heart of it, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. So what I would suggest is a return to the rules-based framework that the UN itself has set up, that the US was the primary architect of. Um, and there's nothing particularly um, anti-American about this, given the fact that everything from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was the fountainhead of Mrs. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, to the Geneva Conventions, to the Nuremberg Principles, um, all of the foundations of the legal framework and the legal rights that we will discuss today are the product of American diplomacy and, and American leadership. So it is really a return to those fundamental American-led but universally embraced values and principles that will lead us out of darkness and into light, inshallah. So let me begin uh, the kind of dry part of this discussion, as I like to call it, um, with, in a sense, three phases. Phase one is the resolutions. Phase two is the law. And phase three, what does that mean for US policy going forward? So the resolutions are many and there's hundreds and thousands of them that one can refer to. Um, and we don't have that much time. Um, nobody has that much time. So what I'll do is just highlight a few of them that I think might kind of give us a path towards the solution. And I want you to keep in mind something that a very, very interesting discussion that I had with an Israeli ambassador circa 2002-2003 when we had an official legal lunch of, of the United Nations and all the legal advisors were at this lunch and I happened to be seated very in close proximity to the Israeli legal advisor of the Israeli mission and in the context of the conversation he was informed or somehow discovered that I'm an Arab of Palestinian origin and he interrupted the, the course of the conversation and looked at me directly individually and said it must give you great satisfaction as a Palestinian that the UN is so pro-Palestinian in its resolutions. And I looked at him and I said, I cannot miss this opportunity and I'm not gonna miss this opportunity. I said, it must give you great satisfaction, sir, as an Israeli, that none of them have been implemented. <laughs> and therefore, when we look at these resolutions, we need to understand that the context is normative, that it has in most cases not been implemented. And while these resolutions get adopted year after year after year after year, and in fact have been diluted year after year after year after year, they have not in fact been fulfilled. Um, and this begins with the first resolution in 1946, sorry, 47, which partitioned the British mandate known as Palestine into an Arab state, a Jewish state, and a special regime for, uh, for Jerusalem. Now, as, as history, has documented the allocation of land was disproportionate in every sense of the word, whether demographically or economically or based on property rights or based on even uh, uh, the, the self-determining rights of the Jewish Palestinians who were in the land. And people fail to remember that there were Jewish Palestinians and remain uh, in, the, in the equation at the time. Uh, we then went to, of course, the establishment of the state of Israel, the, uh, the uh, membership of the state of Israel in the UN. We have the UN resolutions that begin to sort of correct the historical injustice, not so much of the creation of Israel, but the manner in which it was created 
that it was at the, at the expense of the Arab state, at the expense of the Palestinian population, at the expense of the Palestinian right to self-determination, and that this is the enduring debt of the United Nations owed to the Palestinian people. And that is part of its um, uh, enduring kind of uh, successive return to this issue because it is a failure, a fundamental failure that one part of that vision materialized and the other hasn't. Um, and again, the failure is multiple parties are responsible for that, but nonetheless, we have a manifest failure and a manifest injustice as a result. In 1956, we saw something that we never saw again, the United States stepping in to actually uphold international law. And when two and possibly three of its closest allies, US, sorry, the allies being UK, France, and Israel, invaded Egypt in 1956, it was the US that stood up first and foremost and demanded the withdrawal of those troops from Egyptian territory. Um, and with the help of the Secretary General, the matter was moved from the Security Council, where of course the British and the French would have vetoed any action, into the General Assembly, where under the Uniting for Peace resolution that the, that the US had, had in a sense machinated in order to uh, ensure that there was a response to the Korean Peninsula problem in 1950. So they used that same mechanism to demand the withdrawal of the Israelis, the British and the French from Egyptian sovereign territory and set up the first peacekeeping mission of the United Nations, UNEF. Now, many would attribute peacekeeping to the Security Council, but it was in fact the General Assembly on the recommendation of the then Dag Hammarskjöld uh, report that this mission was established. Um, and never again, however, have we seen such a principle stand by the US in, in the Security Council on this issue. Obviously, we've seen it on other issues, but on this issue, it's been a rather mixed record to say the least. The inalienable rights of the Palestinians to national independence and sovereignty were obviously recognized in several resolutions, but they were in a sense culminated when they recognized the PLO as a representative of the Palestinian people and granted the PLO as the representative of the Palestinian people, the observer status in the UN. Um, and not only granting the observer status, but incrementally giving them additional rights of participation up to including the right to include agenda items and to speak in a sense intermingled with the other states um, in the General Assembly, kind of recognizing a special status for Palestine. They then recognized the proclamation of the state of Palestine in 1988. In 2003 was the emergency special session requiring an advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice on the construction of the wall and the consequences thereof. But the premier resolution, of course, doesn't come until 2012, which is after the failure to get membership in the Security Council was the effort to get recognition of statehood in the General Assembly in 2012, which was granted in November 2012. Not only did that resolution grant statehood, but also non-member uh, status in the UN, an encouragement to the Council to admit Palestine not only as a state, but as a member state, and it reframed the entire legal framework applicable to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which is the will of the international community, embodying the legal framework consisting of the independent, sovereign, democratic state of Palestine living side by side in peace and security with the state of Israel in the pre-67 borders. As late as 2012, that was still the demand of the General Assembly um, based on multiple principles, including the ones from the law, but also the Middle East peace processes, the land for peace formula, the Arab peace initiative, and the, uh, as the path to a just lasting and comprehensive peace and named them the five issues, refugees, Jerusalem settlements, borders, security, and water. Now, three of those should not be negotiable because they're fundamental inalienable rights. When we talk about the right of return of refugees, that's an inalienable right, it's not negotiable. So for the UN to render that negotiable is not really a favor to the Palestinians, it's actually possibly a detriment to the Palestinians. The status of Jerusalem, where the illegal acquisition of territory by the use of force, the sui generis special status of Jerusalem, the grave violations that the settlements constitute on the Geneva Conventions have become negotiable. So again, the what seems to be pro-Palestinian resolutions are not exactly necessarily consistent with the binding 
principles of international law. Take UNRWA, for instance. Everybody sees that as a big benefacting you know, uh, uh, contribution to the Palestinian people and their well-being. But it's actually the obligation of the occupying power that UNRWA is now performing. It's money, effort, energy, uh, medicine, food, education, clothing, that Israel as the occupying power should be delivering to the occupant population. So when the UN, the international community, and primarily the US as the primary benefactor, through UNRWA delivers this to the occupant population, they're actually doing a favor to Israel because these are legally the obligations of the state of Israel as the occupying power. So again, this kind of facade that the UN is pro-Palestinian needs to be deconstructed when we look at the fundamentals of the international legal framework. So similarly, let's take a look at the Security Council side. 1967, the, the, the critical resolution 242, which does two things, but somehow is only remembered for one of the two things. It condemns the illegal acquisition of territory by the use of force. Even though what they call pre-67 borders are themselves established by the illegal acquisition of territory by the use of force. But even the Palestinians have accepted that 67 is the starting point. From there, they, so they have condemned it and codified it in the same time as the irony of 242. But then using the land for peace formula, they call for a resolution of the Arab-Israeli conflict based on those 67 borders. We've certainly moved even further than the 67 border um, and talking about land swaps and so, so on and so forth. This land for peace you know, continues to permeate while the moving target of what is demanded of the Palestinian side has also shifted. At first, it was a cessation of hostilities of the Arab nations and the renunciation of the state of belligerence. Then it was the recognition of the state of Israel. Then it was the recognition of the right of the state of Israel to exist. Then it's the right of the uh, state of Israel to exist as a Jewish state. So it's this kind of moving target so that it becomes ever more difficult so at each stage when the Palestinian side capitulates and or concedes, they're asked, it's not enough, they have to, to go one step further, one step further. So none of this is based in law. All that is required is the recognition of the state and the establishment, and that's a political choice, whether or not to have diplomatic relations. So recognition and diplomatic relations usually go together, but they can be bifurcated if one wants to create a graduated or staggered political process. So again, 242 is itself riddled with contradiction, um, but nonetheless is the kind of path towards this land for peace uh, formula that will lead us to a resolution. 1973, of course, the ceasefire for the uh, 1973 war. 1979, we have the, uh, a very categorical condemnation of the settlements and the construction of the settlements and a demand that they, be, that they stop. Um, and that any measures, unilateral measures by Israel to alter the status of Jerusalem also are condemned and declared null and void in 1979. In 1996, we have again, the affirmation of the status of Jerusalem, that's sui generis. We have the first recognition of the two state solution in 2002, and we have yet another call for the end of the construction of settlements in 2016. The mere fact that these resolutions have been adopted by the Security Council means these are resolutions that have the support of the US. Because had they been vetoed, of course, they would not be adopted and they would not exist as resolutions of the council. So all of these that I've just mentioned have the support of the US, either by abstaining or by voting affirmatively to uphold them. So the resolutions make it clear, the occupation has to end, the settlements have to stop, the wall has to be dismantled. The status of Jerusalem has to be respected as sui generis and inter subject to international uh, 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 special status. And that the right of return is inalienable and that there should be a peaceful settlement of the, of the, uh, of the conflict. Of course, again, you know, words on paper, nothing happening in reality. So what does the broader legal framework tell us? The broader legal frameworks, starting with the charter, recognizes the right of self-determination, not just as any old right, but as one of the four fundamental purposes of the organization. Maintain international peace and security, 
resolve conflicts by peaceful means and conformity with justice and international law, develop friendly relations on the basis of the principle of equal rights and self-determination of peoples. It's right there in the second purpose of the four purposes of the UN. Enshrined as you know, the pr premier goal of the organization, not just the guiding principle, but the goal of the organization. Having said that, obviously, just because there's law doesn't mean there's respect for the law. And that's a case that most countries, most histories, most peoples have suffered through. There's nothing unique about the struggle of the Palestinian people from that perspective. What is unique is the longstanding successive rounds, um, uh, despite the, you know, the flurry of activity and the flurry of peace processes and flurry of uh, commitment statements and pronouncements that there has been so little progress and, and um, despite all of this so-called effort. And again, as I've stated at the outset, part of that is because the further away we get from the law, the further away we get from the actual possibility of resolving the conflict. All we have is uh, a deferment of the inevitable, which is the encroaching colonization and settlement and threatened annexation of the uh, of whatever is left of the Palestinian territory. But even then, it's not even about the territory. It comes back and it has to come back to the fundamental human rights of the individual person, as well as as a people, the right of the people of Palestine to self-determination, the same way the right of the Israeli people to their own self-determination which has been fulfilled and is manifested on a daily basis and, and good and bad. Um, so what are these manifest violations of international humanitarian law? The occupation itself, and mind you, Israel has not only occupied Palestinian territory, it has occupied Egyptian territory, Jordanian territory, Lebanese territory, Palestinian territory, and Syrian territory, and continues to occupy uh, Palestinian and Syrian territory to this day. The settlements are themselves a great violation of international law, a war crime. The war crimes committed every time that there's an offensive in uh, Gaza that is disproportionate, indiscriminate, uh, targeting civilian uh, buildings and infrastructure. Uh, whenever there's displacement or deportation of, of uh, individuals, the arbitrary arrests and detentions, the use of torture and the detention of children, all of these are violations of international law as well as uh, both humanitarian law and, uh, and human rights law. Now, of course, Israel has the right of self-defense. There's nothing controversial about that or, or doubtful about that, or one can categorically state Israel has the right of self-defense, as does every individual, as does every people, as does every state. It's an inherent right. But just because they have the right of self-defense doesn't mean that that right is unchecked or unlimited. It has rules, just like any other use of force has rules. It has to be against a objectively determined threat. It has to be a last resort, but there's no other way to remove that threat. There has to be proportionality. There has to be a effort to uh, eliminate and or at least mitigate or um, uh, mitigate against any civilian casualties and collateral civilian damage. So all of these rules apply. So it's not enough to say I have a right to self-defense. Yes, of course you have a right to self-defense. Um, it's the equivalent of when a terrorist says I have a just cause. That doesn't mean you can use any means to fulfill and live up and try to uh, manifest and, and give a reality to your cause. Of course, there's rules that apply. There's ethical rules, moral rules, legal rules, religious rules, all of the above apply as they do to self-defense. Um, so both sides really need to be harnessed. Those who argue that no use of force um, uh, is justified by an occupant population, even against military targets is equally objectionable, offensive, and immoral as to say that in the struggle for national liberation, we have the right to kill civilians. I find both of those statements as a lawyer, as a moral human being, equally objectionable because under international humanitarian law, there is a right to resist colonization and occupation, foreign occupation. 
That is a right that is recognized by international law. But like self-defense, it has to be executed and performed in accordance with the fundamental principles of, of the use of force. The, the distinction between combatants and civilians, the proportionality, so on and so forth. So both sides need a reality check as to what can and can be done in the name of self-defense and or in the name of a just cause. And then we come to the human rights violations that are being violated regularly, the right to life, and that's of the rights of the Israelis who are killed in terrorist attacks or in indiscriminate attacks, as much as the right to life of every Palestinian who dies on the checkpoint giving birth or who dies in a hospital because of the siege and they don't have necessary medical supplies or because they have been bulldozed in their home or they've been bombarded with missile attacks in the middle of the night. So that right to life is sacred for both sides. The right to property, the right to education, the right to live in one's own land, the right uh, to be free from arbitrary detention, free from torture, free from cruel and unusual punishment. All of these, I mean, I, one can do a laundry list, but once again, time is limited. Then, of course, we come back to the right of return, which is the ultimate and inalienable right. Now, legally speaking, that should be the end of the story, but the Palestinians themselves have been willing to put this on the negotiating table. Not necessarily to surrender it, but to negotiate possibly the right of residence instead of the right of citizenship, to negotiate a swap between those who wish to live in the Palestinian state uh, for religious reasons, as well as the Palestinians who would live in the Israeli state, but without acquiring Israeli citizenship. So there are you know, creative pol political formulas that one can achieve without losing sight that fundamentally this is an inalienable right and must be given to each individual and it's that individual's right to decide whether to exercise that right, to waive it or to uh, seek compensation in lieu of exercising it. That cannot be given away on behalf of the individual. So one, one another anecdote, maybe just as a little break from, uh, from the law. Um, I have a, a dear colleague who is Israeli uh, and we often discuss politics and coming at it as, as lawyers, we tend to agree nine times out of 10. Um, the, the 10 out of 10 is usually the most interesting, but the nine times out of 10 as lawyers, you know, we usually converge. And that's why I'm confident that with the rule of law, we can probably find our way out of this uh, so-called intractable conflict. But on one of these occasions, he, he kind of uh, uh, kind of looked off into the sunset and said, I really don't mean to offend you, but I really, I'm just trying to understand, you know, you weren't born in Jerusalem. You've probably never set foot in Jerusalem or in Palestine. Why do you consider yourself Palestinian? I said, I said, you don't have to ask me that. You ask yourself that. You have a better answer than any answer that I can give you. And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, your people for 2000 years demanded their right of return to the state of Israel and would never give up their right of return. And it was their mantra for 2000 years next year in Jerusalem. So you couldn't give up your right after 2000 years and you're asking us to give up our right and, it, and it's within the same century. So ask yourself what made you demand and insist on your right of return and then you'll understand why we demand and insist on ours. It's very basic. If you understand yourself, then you should understand our own struggle. And that seemed to somehow get through to him. Um, uh, I, I hope it certainly ended the conversation right then and there, but uh, something to think about. Now, um, I think we have maybe 10 minutes left in terms of the legal portion. Um, and then we need to get to the, uh, to the US policy. Um, just before we end the legal portion, I want to recall that this doesn't have to be hypothetical. The ICJ, the International Court of Justice, and the International Criminal Court have both pronounced themselves um, to a certain degree on these subjects. There's an advisory opinion in 2003, 2004, by the International Court of Justice. Now, to say that it's an advisory opinion is factual because it was an advisory opinion requested by the General Assembly. But to the extent that the opinion itself contains references to binding customary international law and binding ergo omnis obligations, those elements of the opinion must be regarded as binding, even though they're in a vehicle that is advisory. Um, and, and 
the, the salient conclusions and uh, uh, observations of the court are as follows. Upholding that there shall be no territorial acquisition by the use of force, that Israel has the obligation to respect the right of the Palestinian people to self-determination and all of its obligations on international humanitarian law and human rights law, that it has an obligation to put an end to its wrongful actions, including the dismantlement of the construction and, and the end of the construction of any part of the wall, uh, repealing any and all legislation relating to it, uh, confirming Israel's obligation to make reparations for the losses, damages of all natural and legal persons, including destruction of homes, businesses, livelihoods, and ag agricultural holdings. On the uh, unexpected side of the ruling is the court's reminder to all states, parties to the Geneva Conventions, uh, that they have an obligation to recognize violations as violations, to seek to bring an end and ensure respect to the, uh, for the law and end to those violations, and not to contribute in any way, aiding or assisting in the commission and or continuation of those violations. And this has to be borne in mind when we talk about not just US policy, but about any country's policy, including the Arab states, the Gulf states, the EU as a regional organization, the African Union, the League of Arab States. These, whether it's a state or a group of states, they have these obligations under the Geneva Conventions. So recognize a violation, ensure respect for the law by ending the violation, and making sure that you do not in some way contribute aid of that or in otherwise be complicit in the commission or continuation of the violation. So we need to come back to that in light of what the ICC is investigating. Well, the ICC has not, of course, uh, proceeded to trial on any of this. They're merely investigating um, commission of crimes, not just by Israel, but also by Hamas. In Gaza, they have investigated alleged crimes by the IDF, including the disproportionate attacks, indiscriminate attacks, attacks on civilian uh, uh, densely populated areas, residential buildings and other infrastructure, attacks on UN facilities, hospitals, paramedics and ambulances, widespread destruction of civilian, destruction of civilian buildings and infrastructure, and the disproportionate loss of civilian life. Against the uh, uh, Palestinian armed groups, they are investigating indiscriminate use of force, launching of attacks from civilian areas, and summary execution of collaborators. In the West Bank and East Jerusalem, they are investigating, and it's fair to say that these things have been committed, the planning, construction, development, and consolidation of settlements as a great violation of the Geneva Conventions, the confiscation and appropriation of land, demolitions of Palestinian property and homes and the eviction of residents, the destruction of Palestinian owned property and structures in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, the displacement of people, the deportation of persons, the acts of violence by settlers against Palestinian communities, the ill treatment of the detainees, the arbitrary detentions, the detention and uh, systemic institutionalized ill treatment of children, um, and uh, there is also a, of course, new round going to be uh, uh, culminating as a result of the recent events. Um, the portfolio would, would of, the, of the prosecutor, now it's a new prosecutor, whether they continue in the same vein as the prior prosecutor remains to be seen. So what does this all mean in the remaining five minutes for the US? So first and foremost, of course, there's US policy and there's US law. Supreme Court has held that international law is part of the supreme law of the land. The US policy and the law recognize settlements, let's take just settlements alone, as being illegal, as being a grave violation of international law. So from the point of view of the settlements, what can the US do, even in the absence of agreement between the parties, even in the absence of uh, success in the peace process, Certainly you shouldn't allow your citizens to live in settlements. Certainly you shouldn't allow your citizens to donate and make contributions to the construction of settlements or to the maintenance and sustenance of settlements. Those are certainly things that are within the US jurisdiction if they want to be a responsible actor towards peace and justice. Certainly they should condition their support to the Palestinian Authority similarly to respect for human rights, you know, allegations of 
uh, uh, arbitrary attention and torture are also being lodged against the, uh, the Palestinian Authority. Those need to be investigated as well and should, on the support of the US for the Palestinian Authority should be conditioned on those uh, investigations being carried out in an effective way and the responsible parties being held accountable. Other human rights violations equally should be part of that. It could be illegal detention, it could be postponement of elections, it could be uh, the treatment and, and some allegations of uh, uh, killing of opposition figures, for instance. Um, the arms sales of the US clearly should be conditioned based on the use and compliance of the use of those weapons with uh, international humanitarian law. Um, and granted, we can say that these are merely allegations, but they should be investigated before sales are allowed to go through. And last but not least, the US use of the veto. It's a sovereign right of the United States to use its veto as it sees fit, but that right is not unconditional. As a state party to the Geneva Convention, as we said, they have obligations, ergo omnis obligations, to ensure respect for international humanitarian law, to bring an end to violations of that law and not to contribute. And by providing cover for violations of humanitarian law, the most serious violations, they are in effect allowing the continuation. And therefore the, the use of the veto should be perceived and, ex and exercised within that broader framework. So with that, I think, uh, all parties have a lot of work to do. The rest of the membership of the UN and the international community at large have duties to ensure respect for the law. And we're not talking about every law and every regulation. We're talking about those fundamental principles about the occupation, the settlements, the right to life, and the right to self-determination, and the right of return. Those four or five fundamental principles. Without those, we cannot have justice, and without justice, we cannot have peace. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mona. I think this is a, an excellent uh, overview of uh, the landscape in terms of international laws that relates to Palestine, Israel, and, and the US role. And uh, from uh, the looks of uh, our audience members, you, you're given another uh, standing ovation. So thank you for that. Um, thank you for your attention. Yes, uh, there's a lot to cover. Uh, and we have a number of questions already. Uh, from our guests, and I will get to them. I just wanted to dive a little more uh, deeply into the issue of the international uh, courts or investigations. I don't know exactly where it emanates from. You could probably give us a, a better idea of how that works. Um, what, in fact, why don't we start with that? How does how does how, how do uh, investigations uh, in terms of international law, the international uh, criminal courts, how, how do they originate? And how, mm -hmm. how it, does it apply to the situation in the occupied territories? Um, well, there's several ways um, how this can happen. Um, uh, before there was an international criminal court, um, there were, uh, of course, you know, national prosecution is, is always a possibility. Some crimes and many of the crimes committed by Israel are universal crimes, which can be tried in any court of law anywhere in the world. And there is precedent where uh, Belgian uh, law courts were seized, uh, especially during the days of Sharon, uh, of war crime uh, uh, charges being lodged in Belgian courts. Um, and there's a long history of how those were somehow set aside. But universal jurisdiction is available and has been availed in other, in other contexts. Um, but the existence of international criminal courts uh, is, is a relatively new phenomenon. Um, it's a positive development, of course, in international law, uh, where first you had the International Criminal Tribunal, for instance, for the former Yugoslavia, you had one for Rwanda, you had one for Lebanon, you had one for Sierra Leone, uh, for Cambodia. So, and they're manifested differently. Some of them are hybrid with a national component and an international component. But the strictly speaking international ones were the ICTY for former Yugoslavia and the one for Rwanda. And those were established with uh, uh, a Security Council resolution and a statute, kind of like a treaty, uh, uh, for their for their establishment, similar to the statute that established the International Court of Justice, um, albeit that that's not a criminal court. Um, within the statute are the basis for jurisdiction. Um, so now we come to the International Criminal Court, which has seized jurisdiction of the situation in Palestine. Now the Palestinian side has tried to get 
uh, the court to be seized on several occasions before they successfully did. Uh, by trying to become a party, trying to make a declaration of acceptance of jurisdiction. But the court hesitated um, because this question of the statehood of Palestine was uh, rather fluid legally because it's fundamentally a, a legal question, but there are obviously political underpinnings to it. But that hurdle was removed when the General Assembly recognized the statehood of Palestine, even though as a non-member state of the UN, non-member observer state of the UN in 2012. And at that point, the International Criminal Court could accept the instrument of accession of the Palestinian state as a state to become a party. Uh, so to the extent that Palestine became a party, clearly jurisdiction attaches. Um, and the Palestinians themselves requested the, you know, the prosecutor to carry out the investigation. Now, this is a double-edged sword, of course, because in so doing, they're not only opening up investigation of the Israeli side, they are, whether they like it or not, opening up investigation of their own actions. And certainly of Hamas's actions, of course, the PA would be more than happy for Hamas to be held accountable as they should be held accountable for their own war crimes and uh, illegal uses of force. But, the, but, but in theory, the Palestinian Authority itself, their actions would be and should be also under examination. Um, to the extent that they rise to the level of a crime under the statute. Uh, so this is sort of the evolution of where we got to, to the current investigation. Um, the, the jurisdiction has been recently confirmed. Um, it was uh, uh, determined by the prosecutor and submitted by the prosecutor to the, the panel of judges, which confirmed the assessment that there is jurisdiction. So now the investigation will proceed. As I stated earlier, there is a new prosecutor and it's not clear whether the, the intentions of the current prosecutor to dedicate resources uh, to carry that investigation forward is as firm as the, as the conviction of the prior prosecutor. That remains to be seen. And, and to be clear, all parties uh, are subject to examination, as you said. So that includes the State of Israel, the Palestinian Authority, Hamas, on the State of Israel, uh, the, the, if it has crossed the line in terms of its claims for right uh, of self-defense and mm -hmm. from the Hamas side and, and PA theoretically, uh, it's uh, right uh, uh, of resistance if it has crossed the lines in terms of limits on that as well. Well, Israel has objected to the fact that it itself is not a party to the ICC statute. However, to the extent that it's committing acts within territory recognized by the court and by the international community at large as occupied territory, not Israeli territory, um, they would be um, subject to the jurisdiction of the court. They reject that, of course, um, on, the, on the basis that they themselves are not a party. Um, uh, the, uh, the question of Israel's status is itself interesting. Um, I don't know if, how much interest there is, but it may be worth mentioning. Mm -hmm. On the eve of the closing of the signature of the Rome Statute, which established the International Criminal Court, both the U.S. and Israel signed the statute. So they are signatories to the statute. This was done under the administration of, of Bill Clinton. Soon after, the administration of George W. Bush came into uh, office, and they renounced that signature indicating that they have no intention of ever ratifying or becoming a party to the statute, which is the only way to basically unsign. So most of the human rights you know, commentators said, oh, you know, Bush is get, committing yet another Ill illegal act. You cannot unsign a treaty, but in fact, under treaty law, you, you can't unsign it, but you can effectively unsign it by declaring that you will never become a party. Israel has never done that. Israel has not renounced its signature and it has not indicated that it has no intention of ratifying. So technically it remains a, a signatory, um, even though it is not a party. And as a signatory, it has one good faith duty under international law, which is not to defeat the object and purpose of, of the statute. And whether its actions amount to defeating the purpose of the statute or not, is for somebody else to judge, but that is a, a, an obligation of all signatories. Thank you. Uh, and to our guests, go ahead and start uh, typing your questions into the chat box and we'll 
ask our uh, our guest, uh, our expert uh, on on the matter. And there's there's a lot of expertise uh, on this issue uh, for sure. Um, I, I wanted to uh, ask you then about U.S. Uh, culpability uh, because it is uh, financing uh, and providing military aid uh, and uh, providing political protection uh, for uh, the occupation uh, and, and you know a number of Americans uh, end up in the settlements um, and uh, uh, is is there is there culpability then of the United States if this if this uh, investigation were to develop, that the United States itself could potentially be violating uh, international law and uh, be accused of war crimes as well, or supporting war crimes, let's say. Uh, I mean, that certainly is an allegation that one can make. Um, it would require a, a court to, to reach a verdict on that question, um, whether it's a national court or otherwise. and. and questions of international law, including international criminal law, are best answered in the first instance by the national jurisdiction. Um, even the International Criminal Court recognizes the principle of complementarity, that when the state itself is willing to effectively and meaningfully uh, litigate and, and prosecute the, allegate, the alleged crimes, there is no need for the International Criminal Court to, um, to investigate these things. So even Israel, if it were willing to meaningfully and effectively prosecute the alleged crimes, investigate and prosecute, there would be no need for the jurisdiction of the ICC. But here we're not talking about the commission of crimes. At best, we're talking about, as you said, you know, contribution to the commission of crimes um, and or possibly acts of omission uh, in the sense that where they have leverage or influence. Certainly nobody's gonna argue that the US is responsible for the Israeli uh, officials and or Israeli military leaders. But to the extent that they have contributed, and let's borrow a term from the US uh, counterterrorism regime, material support to those- right. aiding, acts, aiding and abetting, I was gonna say. Aiding and abetting right. and uh, providing aid and assistance, um, right. which is the official term of the, uh, of the, of the Geneva Conventions. There would be uh, certainly support for it would be an alleged an alleged crime you could say. Um, in addition to the the sort of or the ominous one of not um, of not ensuring respect, which is probably hard to prosecute. But the the in the case of the U.S., you do have actual physical aiding and abetting going on that one could form an allegation. But it would be an allegation. It wouldn't be a conviction. There would need to be a, a, a proper uh, court um, and due process and all of the rest of it before you could reach a verdict. And would somebody have to make uh, a, a case and then present it to the international court? Or does the investigator, him, him or herself, whoever it is, the person, uh, the, the prosecutor, they come up uh, with the case? I mean, I don't think. Uh, I'm not personally aware of any such allegation being made at the present moment or any such investigation being lodged or launched at the present moment. I think the mere um, recognition that to the extent that the US endeavors and proclaims uh, its desire to be a responsible party contributing to peace and justice, that in fact, it may not only be failing to contribute to peace and justice, but may actually be contributing to war and injustice is a sufficient normative um, reorientation of the conversation that might hopefully uh, cause some introspection within those who are making policy and those who are uh, seeking new approaches to the question of Palestine is precisely why uh, that return to the rules-based order should allow us to reimagine what the U.S.'s role in this conflict is. And, and in terms of U.S. law, there's the Leahy Law and the U.S. Arms Export Control Act that prevent the United States from sending weapons to any country that violates human rights uh, in using those weapons. In other words, they would use those weapons against civilian populations. So the U.S. may May, may be in fact violating its own law there, but there's no standing for anybody to make the case within the United States. I think 
it has to be members of Congress that actually have to uh, make that case in applying that law. Do, do you have any any uh, any uh, insight on on how that would uh, ever come to uh, to fruition? Well, it's kind of happening now. I think uh, McCollum herself. I think I'm, I'm not sure oh, if I'm pronouncing that name correct. Yeah, uh, she has quite. If uh, I would say categorically made that statement with no, without mincing words, that that is certainly something that needs to be looked at. Um, and again, we're dealing with allegations and this is where the problem is. Until it's proven in a court of law, it remains an allegation. It could be a very credible allegation, one with plenty of probable cause and plenty of, of substantiating and circumstantial evidence. But until it's found to be the case in a court of law, it remains an allegation. Um, and, and part of the problem is precisely that, that there is no investigation. Forget about a prosecution. They don't even bother investigating. Um, and that is a failure of, of due process, if nothing else, not just for the sake of the victims, but for the sake of purporting to be a rules-based uh, society, a rules-based uh, nation, a rules-based... And, and when you seek to have others respect the law, you know, this becomes uh, a, a devaluing or a, a, a kind of a, a thorn in your uh, ability to represent yourself as a credible advocate for the rule of law when, when it can be shown. And, and there is, I would say, significance in demonstrating that, that contribution to the violation, that contribution to the continuation of violations, because it, it does matter to the US, both in terms of its uh, soft power, as they call it, as well as its credibility, as well as its own self-perception as an agent of, of certain values. So I think there, that messaging will, will have an impact, I believe, but maybe I'm naive and idealistic, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> well, we should all, always be pursuing ideals, e even if they're just ideas. It's important to at least have the idea out there. So <laughs> thank, thank you for your answers. Uh, uh, and we have a number of questions uh, a lot of them from one person, uh, Carl <laughs> Holberg. Uh, I'll try to I'll try to cover as much as we can, Carl, in the time that we have. Uh, but the, his first question is: On what basis is the return of Palestinian refugees an inalienable right? No other refugees of war, such as Germans from Eastern Europe, Hindus from Pakistan, Muslims from India, Greeks from Turkey, etc., have ever had such a right. Uh, all refugees have that right. Um, it's not just the Palestinian refugees. Now, they happen to be a, a significant proportion of the world population of refugees, but nonetheless, the right of return is an inalienable right as confirmed in the uh, Refugee Convention, which itself has reached the status of customary law, as well as successive General Assembly and Security Council resolutions. So, um, but again, it's a right that belongs to all refugees. And most refugees, uh, 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 want to return, but you don't have to return. It's just that you have the right of return. Um, and whether you exercise that right uh, is, is a, a, a personal choice that can be made and compensation can be given. Now, there's also the flip side of that. Many Israelis argue that those who were forced to flee Arab nations, interestingly, not after the 47, 48 period, but after the 67 period, many Arab states, did in fact uh, uh, force the, the uh, Jewish populations to, uh, to leave or they felt sufficiently under threat or sufficiently persecuted to leave. They are refugees also. Um, and, uh, and it's perfectly fair that they claim their right of return. Um, but that is a, a right that belongs to all peoples and to all refugees, including the Jewish refugees who choose, who wish to exercise their right would themselves have a right of return and a right to compensation if they if they do not uh, if they're not allowed to exercise that right of return? I, I, I gather, you know, as a common person, I see a refugee is by definition a person who's displaced from his or her homeland. So, so. not really. It has to be why they're being displaced. It has hmm. to be uh, the refugee convention is rather narrow in its definition. There are current efforts to expand it. Um, it would certainly, uh, as a result of violence or, or persecution, uh, a physical threat. Um, but many argue that you know economic migration is a form of refugee, 
uh, climate change refugees as a form of refugee, but those two categories are not yet within the definition of refugee. It, it, the, the current definition still requires fleeing violence, fleeing physical persecution. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, Carl's next question is, if there is a right to national self-determination, how will this new approach deal with the fact that both Hamas and Fatah refuse to recognize the right of the Jews to self-determination? Both Hamas and Fatah continually call for from the river to the sea, Palestine must be free. This is clearly a denial of the Jews' right to a sovereign state anywhere in the territory of the former British Palestine mandate. Does Israel have the right to exist as a Jewish state or not? After all, both Hamas and Fatah want an Arab Islamic state from the river to the sea. Um, I believe that that is at best outdated information. Um, there are uh, uh, statements of that nature that have been made um, both officially and unofficially in the past by both uh, sides, but I think it's been more than 30 years since anybody in the PLO used that language. Um, and Hamas, uh, uh, for more than 10 years, has, has been willing to recognize Israel and its pre-67 borders. Uh, the PLO and the Palestinian population in general is willing to recognize Palestine even with what they call adjusted uh, borders from 67. So not only do they recognize the state of Israel, they also recognize um, uh, they're willing to set a border, which Israel itself has not been willing to do. Uh, in particular, Netanyahu, there are other Israeli uh, politicians. Hopefully the new government will bring some, uh, some, uh, some clarity as to what Israel's border should be, because we, we don't know what Israel wants its border to be. We know what the Palestinians are willing to, to accept. Um, but also let's not forget that not only the Arab Peace Initiative has been accepted by all Arab countries, including what are deemed to be the rejectionist Arab countries have accepted it, as well as the Muslim Conference, the Islamic Organization uh, of uh, uh, the Islamic Conference, I believe is the new Organization of the Islamic Conference, OIC. Oh, OIC, yes. oh, exactly. Uh, so all Muslim and Arab states are willing to recognize the state of Israel. So that is the case for the last 20 years. Um, that is the current state of affairs. Um, um, and I mean, somebody far smarter than me once set up a triangle where you have, um, you know, the Jewish democratic nature of the state of Israel, peace and security is the other uh, uh, part of the triangle. And then the third leg of the triangle is the uh, 67 territories. And, and the conundrum that faces Israel is that it can only have two out of those three at any given time. You can be a Jewish democratic state within the 67 territories, but then you lose peace and security. If you want peace and security and Jewish democratic state, then you have to give up the 67 territory. If you want the 67 territory and peace and security, then you cease to be Jewish or democratic. So that, you know, that is the conundrum and only the Israeli people can, can prioritize uh, you know, the, the definition of their state, the borders of their state, um, and the nature of their state. That is something that the Israeli people, I believe, I certainly believe that the majority of the, of the, of the Israeli people have time and time again shown their, that, that they would choose peace over occupied territory. The problem is with Israeli politics, it gives too much leverage to this coalition forming, which allows the extremist elements of the political landscape to have uh, to somewhat dictate uh, what Israeli uh, policy ends up being. Um, so there is, of course, obviously extremist elements within the Palestinian camp, within uh, uh, other Arab camps that certainly uh, uh, cause distortions of the Palestinian landscape as well. Thank you. Uh... And then the other last question from this gentleman is, how can Palestine be considered a state when it clearly does not meet the accepted standards for a state under the Montevideo Convention? Palestine has no sovereign control over its territory. Palestine has no defined territory and Palestine has no unified government. The, um, yeah, the four Montevideo Convention principles are a recognized population, a recognized territory, a recognized government, and the ability to form treaties with other states. Um, it is uh, the, the overwhelming consensus of the overwhelming majority of member states of the international community that those four criteria are fulfilled. 
there are at least two uh, members of the international community that do not agree. Um, and uh, ultimately, you know, one can look at it legally and one can substantiate those four legal requirements. And I believe that has been done uh, many, many times and many, many fora. Um, but ultimately that is the, 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 the position of the Americans and the Israelis in the Security Council that blocked the application for membership in the Security Council. Um, it was not rejected. It never came back to the Security Council. It remains in committee since 2011 to the present date, um, pending uh, some kind of resolution that allows it to go forward. So to be clear, the United States is for a two-state solution but doesn't support the acknowledgement of a Palestinian state in international uh, uh, law? Um, it supports the two-state solution. It, uh, it would, I mean, I, I, I'm trying to articulate the US position and I don't want to misrepresent it, um, but my understanding of the U.S. position is that while they support a two-state solution, they want the Palestinian state to be the outcome of a negotiation with the Israelis, as opposed to be a manifestation of a U.N. pronouncement and or a international legal pronouncement, but rather a product of a negotiation. Again, coming back to the fact that both the U.N. and the U.S. have allowed certain fundamental rights to become negotiable, including the refugee, the status of Jerusalem, the, um, the uh, right of self-determination, the right of return. And with a certain degree, the Palestinians and their uh, eagerness to please some of the Palestinian actors have themselves accepted this. Um, and the Oslo Accord uh, itself makes uh, five those five issues, three of which um, are, are now despite being legally binding are nonetheless politically negotiable. Thank you. Uh, one member of our audience would like clarification what the overall objective is. Uh, uh, for example, in one conversation online, they're mentioning how Israel should no longer exist uh, and is asking if the Palestinian struggle uh, attempting to eradicate the existence of Israel? I, uh, I mean, like I said, of course, there's uh, crackpot uh, extremists on, in every quarter of every place in this world, um, as we have seen recently, even in the United States. Um, by the same token, I do not believe that any party to the conflict maintains that position neither officially nor unofficial. Um, and that would include the most extremist element uh, of, of Hamas. Um, they are on record willing to agree to even a, a full-fledged peace with Israel in its pre-1967 borders. Um, and like I said, clearly the Palestinian Authority agreed to that many, many decades ago, but the entire Arab uh, uh, states and Muslim states have also agreed to that. Officially, formally, publicly, proudly. Uh, the next question is, can individuals sue Israel or does it have to be a country or institution? It depends on the mechanisms. I mean, there, of course, in, a, in the International Court of Justice, only states can bring uh, uh, litigation against other states. Um, there is something called the Universal Periodic Review in the Human Rights uh, Council, where all states, every single state, including the permanent members of the Security Council, are subject periodically to this universal review of their human rights record. And that process allows individuals and organizations of civil society to submit information. Um, so if anybody has a grievance, they can submit, whether it's against the PA or against the Israelis or against any government in the, in the world, um, depending on when the review of that particular country is scheduled, uh, can receive information. Um, there can be civil and or criminal litigation in national courts, depending on the laws of the particular national courts. As we see, you know, there's litigation against various countries for either actions of their citizens or actions of their diplomats or actions of their 
uh, security forces. So, I mean, there's like any other, uh, like, like any other state. Of course, there's like any other state also on the flip side is sovereign immunity of the state. Um, and it's not likely that any such cases will prevail um, given the sovereign immunity of the state. Next question is, why are Palestinians not allowed to do Hajj? Uh, and do you think Saudi Arabia and Gulf states should take in refugees if no permanent solution is reached with Israel? I'm not aware that there's any ban on Palestinians doing Hajj. In fact, that would uh, violate the right, the, the, the responsibility and the, I believe the prevailing practice and policy of, of the, uh, of the Saudi government as the custodian of the holy mosques, they have a duty to the Muslim community at large, not just to fellow Arabs, but to fellow Muslims. And I'm not aware of any such uh, uh, such restriction. Now, some Palestinians may have trouble because of travel documents. That may be a, a de facto problem, not necessarily a uh, legal problem, but a practical problem. And their ability to navigate the requirements may be as a result difficult, but I do not, believe that there's any stated restriction on the Palestinian population. Quite the contrary, there's uh, many Palestinians. I myself am a Saudi national born um, in Saudi Arabia and uh, have not experienced any uh, uh, discrimination in that regard or in any other regard with regard to my civil and uh, other rights other than those facing other Saudi citizens, of course, but, uh, but not because I'm a Palestinian uh, origin national. Uh, and then the last question, unless I, uh, I receive any others after this, uh, do you, as a, as a practitioner and an expert in international law, do you foresee a time in your life where international law will be upheld on, on the issue of Palestine? I do, I do. And I think, I mean, we have um, uh, two very, very, um, real tangible allies in that struggle. And they are the Israeli people and the Jewish American people. Um, I think uh, two of your upcoming guests are amongst the strongest advocates for peace, justice, and the rule of law. Um, that's uh, J Street and Jewish Voice for Peace um, have been very effective in opening up the space for this dialogue within the uh, American discourse um, and have given cover to, you know, uh, uh, senators and congressmen and women with conscience um, uh, to, to have those discussions and to make those uh, uh, observations in a, in a free and uh, uh, I would say uh, clear manner. Um, I think the other is that their Israeli journalists have been braver than, than, than most in drawing attention to the crimes uh, of the uh, Israeli war machine. Um, they, uh, the human rights activists um, uh, uh, amongst the, the Israeli human rights groups are on the front lines of, uh, of the struggle. Uh, the refuseniks are brave soldiers who refuse to uh, 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 render service to an occupation and to the uh, protection of illegal settlements and to illegal acts by settlers. So, I mean, the, uh, the, 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 the shared interest and a peaceful coexistence where the Israeli children and the Palestinian children can grow in peace, where Israeli parents and Palestinian parents can uh, dream of a better life for their children is shared. And there was a time um, in my lifetime when it wasn't Arab versus Israeli or Palestinian versus Israeli, but those of us who were pro-peace and pro-justice and those who weren't. And, I, I, uh, and all it takes is a switch of leadership you know, when we pick our leaders, we have to be careful to pick leaders that represent our hopes and our dreams and not necessarily our hates and our fears. Um, and when we do that, there's always hope. Excellent. Um, the uh, other question about certain Jewish groups and Israel groups, Israeli uh, human rights group, B'Tselem uh, has declared that what's happening against Palestinians is apartheid. Uh, Human Rights Watch has done the same. Um, does that have any bearing in terms of uh, prosecutions of, of war crimes in international court? 
Um, I mean, it is, it is a listed crime in the statute. It is a separate crime under international law. Um, I, I, my personal view, and I may not be answering strictly speaking as a lawyer, is that it's not necessarily helpful um, because it, it becomes such a lightning rod um, that it, it distracts from very fundamental, clearly, unequivocally, categorically committed violations. Um, and then it becomes about this, you know, uh, the, this word and not again, the, the, the fundamental individuals that are being uh, affected on a daily basis. Um, so while it certainly is a legitimate allegation, one that can be, you know, made and substantiated even, I don't necessarily think the focus should be on that, but rather on the very basic fundamental rights um, of right to life, uh, right to bear children is being denied, the right to have access to medical supplies, to have access to medical facilities, um, the right to work your property, to, uh, uh, to have food, to have water. I mean, those are, rights and violations that need to be addressed um, and can be addressed with greater clarity, greater precision and greater uh, substantiation than getting caught up in the, in the bigger dilemma. Well, that is without prejudice to, of course, the existence of the crime um, under law, but, uh, but just in terms of what it means for this particular conflict. Um, you mentioned Israelis and Jewish Americans. What about Christians, uh, the Palestinian Christians uh, have, you know, their, their population has been decimated uh, to, I, I believe, 10% or even lower than what it was pre-1967. Mm -hmm. um, there are many churches uh, throughout the United States working uh, for Palestinian mm -hmm. rights. Do you see them playing a role uh, like Jewish Americans are, are playing in, on this issue? Um, I mean, definitely. I mean, I think for, for, I mean, at least as far as the conversation we're having today about a new American approach, I think your average American would, would be, even the most well-intentioned one would be shell-shocked if you said Palestinian Christian or Palestinian Jew. I mean, that just would, you know, completely befuddle them. Um, they would even be confused at the concept of, a, of an Israeli Arab. Um, of which there are, you know, uh, close to what is it, twenty to twenty-five percent of the population of Israel, um, uh, and of, of many of which are also Christian. Um, so there is plenty for the Christian community to do, especially vis-a-vis -vis the the most extreme Christian elements in the in the U.S., the evangelical, you know, uh, strain, which has ironically found itself in alliance with the with the most extreme of the um, I would say Likud or APAC or whatever elements of the Israeli spectrum of the political uh, scene and I, I, I truly do not understand that um, given what the evangelicals believe about the Jews and what the what the I mean it just doesn't make sense to me but you know uh, somebody else can try to explain it um, but so politics, you know, that politics makes for interesting bedfellows. Let's just put it that Indeed, down. that's <laughs> a good way. Um, so, so Christians can clarify the role of, you know, uh, that, you know, if nothing else, that Jesus is Palestinian, as my niece is often prone to reminding everybody. Um, and, uh, and as a result, it's, uh, they do have an important role, both in terms of affirming their existence. Um, and affirming, you know, the, the role of, of the, the multi-faith, the, the tri-faith, the beauty of the love that Christianity, Judaism, and Islam all have for Jerusalem. And I've always said that that should be the path to the solution and not the source of the problem. Um, and for many centuries, in fact, it was, you know, there was the one key that was held by, you know, on behalf of the three communities and uh, continues till this day to be the case. Um, so that is really the path, the path to the solution is that the shared love of the land and the shared love of Jerusalem in particular should not be, um, uh, should not be dividing us, but should be uniting us. Well, Muna, uh, I want to, you know, on behalf of uh, everybody, 
Uh, and just to read some of the comments, uh, thank you, amazing, knowledgeable, highly qualified speaker, uh, wonderful series uh, by Joan and Paul uh, Waller. Uh, uh, also, uh, Reinhard Krauss from the Academy of Islamic uh, Jewish Christian Studies uh, said that uh, this has been extraordinary, very lucid, very impressive. Uh, uh, awesome Muna from Hadab uh, Tarifi, uh, and thank you. Uh, and so, so many people saying thank you. Uh, I think this has been extraordinary and we get to learn from you without having to pay tuition. Uh, so I, uh, I, you know, this is a, a, a double, uh, the pleasure, double the fun uh, in this, uh, um, um, in uh, today's program. Um, thank you for this program and this series, Carl Selkin. Thank you, Mana Imaduddin Ahmed. He runs the Minaret Institute uh, in, uh, in, in Washington, DC. Uh, thank you so much for this wonderful discussion, uh, Rebecca Hosseini. Hearts uh, all around. Uh, I can't say enough. Uh, I, I learned a lot uh, and definitely uh, will we'll remain connected because we definitely need this kind of expertise. This is what I mean by the new approach is when we're talking about justice, let it, 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 justice applies to all parties and then let justice determine uh, how to um, come to a resolution rather than just saying it's my side against uh, everyone else. And as you said, playing on people's fears and prejudices uh, instead of playing, uh, instead of implementing our, um, our thirst for justice. So uh, that is so, so uh, important for all of us to hear today. And your expertise in terms of understanding the landscape uh, as Reinhard Krauss said, so lucid. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. I'm humbled and honored, and uh, and I wish you every every success in your very worthy endeavor to uh, bring to bring light and to bring knowledge and to bring understanding. You've definitely helped us in that mission. So, and and thank you. And we say, inshallah, God willing, with uh, with this work. Uh, I thank everybody for joining us. Uh, yes, let's all give uh, one a round of applause. We can see applause uh, throughout. Everybody's giving you applause now. Yeah. Uh, we have a standing ovation if we're in a room. Um, and so, uh, and inshallah, you know, someday we'll bring you to Los Angeles or Washington and have you speak in person for us. Uh, I next, look forward. yes, it, uh, we look forward. To, thank you. And we, it, and we look forward to, to being with you. And I know it's what's it's two, it's almost 2 30 AM right now in Vienna. So, uh, I hope you get some, some rest after this and some, some well-deserved sleep. Uh, for your hard work and preparation for uh, our, um, uh, our lecture series. Uh, next week, we have uh, Professor David Myers, who will give us uh, the, a short history of Zionism uh, and uh, the legacy of Rabbi Leonard Bierman. Rabbi Leonard Bierman was a great friend uh, of uh, the Islamic Center of Southern California, and he founded uh, Rabbis for Human Rights here in the U.S., and he had spoken uh, during Yom Kippur um, sermons uh, about uh, the war against Gaza. So we get to hear from David Myers, who's part of that Leonard, Leonard Berman Foundation, and get his perspective on the history of Zionism. After that, we'll have uh, Peter Beinhardt and uh, uh, Jeremy Benami uh, debate Jewish home versus a Jewish state. Then after that, Ken Roth, uh, on apartheid and how to end apartheid uh, in Palestine. And after that, we will uh, cover the nexus of Islamophobia and anti-Palestine, anti anti-Palestinian rhetoric in the United States. So hope you continue joining us in this series. Uh, this has been quite an extraordinary lesson uh, on the Palestinian issue from so many different perspectives already. It's been amazing. So I thank all of you for joining us. Again, thank you, Mona. God bless you for all that you do. Thank you. <laughs>